Good morning and welcome to Lake of the Isles Lutheran Church in this season of Pentecost. We're delighted that you are gathered here with us today as we hear again the stories from the Old Testament of the early kings. It was also a day in which we celebrate the music of France, uh, the traditional date of Bastille Day on the 14th, always known not necessarily positively for the Christian faith in France at that time, but it also gave us many different traditions. As we look to France, we note that the first hymn, perhaps the most well-known hymn in English hymnody, is actually French, Louis Bourgeois. And so we begin that. It was a battle between what were known as the Huguenots, the uh, Protestants, and the Catholics. And so we have within our service today both the hymns that are found in France today uh, with that representation by the Protestants as well as songs that you will hear sung in Latin to remind us of that Catholic tradition of the church as well. And in between what has become perhaps the most important movement within the church in France and that is the Taizé movement. And there we will hear songs from the Taizé group as well. And so as we begin this worship service Looking again to the kings of old, we begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise for the call to worship. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who dwell therein. For the Lord has found it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? And who may stand in God's holy place? For those of innocent hands and purity of heart, who do not swear on God's being, nor do they pledge by what is false. They shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek you, O Lord, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, O everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Truly the Lord of hosts is the King of glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together the prayer for this day. O oh God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of the unlearned, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The congregation may be seated. And we invite the uh, children to come forward for the children's message. I know, Tommy, there you are. Come on up. Well, I will just start talking, and if they decide to come up, that would be great. Good morning. <laughs> I am going to tell you more about King David today, and I have a little something to show you. Um, David has just become king. We talked about that last week. And uh, he did two very important things when he first became king. The first thing that he did, good morning, you can have a sit, seat on the circles, choose a circle to sit on there. Perfect. Awesome. So David became king, and the first thing that he did is he moved the capital city to Jerusalem. Hi. And the second thing he did is he, move, he wanted to move the Ark of the Covenant. Do you see what I have in my hands here? I'm going to get down a little lower so you can take a look at it. This is a really tiny version of it. Can you see it? It's really fancy. It was made with gold on top, and it's got these little handles that they would use to carry it, and it sat on wood. And inside of it was something super important, it was the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses to give the people all the rules that we, we live by, the things to remember. So David went to Judah to go get it, and he brought 30,000 of his men to go get it, like, we're going to bring this. And they put it on a really big cart, and there were some ox that were carrying it, and you know what happened? One of the ox kind of tripped. And you know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? It started falling off the cart, and a guy named Uzzah, he, he caught it. But God was kind of mad about that happening. And King David's like, I don't want God to get mad, so we're just going to park it right here. And I have this guy named Obadidim, and I'm going to see if he can take care of it for me for a while. So the ark got to sit safely at Obadidim's house for three months. And God was like, I'm not mad about this anymore. And David knew that. So he says, okay, now we're going to start traveling again. So he goes to Obadidim's house and said, thank you so much for taking care of it. He gave him a blessing. He loaded it up on the cart. And super careful, he brought it finally to Jerusalem. And it didn't fall off the cart. And that was a good thing. So now, as they got to the city, they were so happy that when they got there, David started singing and dancing and just having a great time, and everyone got so excited that that happened. And now, the Ark of the Covenant was in the capital city of Jerusalem. And this was important for God's people because it reminded them that God is with them and keeps his promises always. Okay? That's our story today. Should we say a prayer? And fold our hands. Thank you, God, for the story of King David and God's promises that are always kept. But also, help us remember to worship with lots of praise and singing and joyfulness. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to sing a song now that is really happy and joyful. And there's some clapping that you can do. Pay attention to the music halfway through. So sing with great joy. <clears throat> And we'll see you next week. Thanks for coming up. You shall go out with joy.
scripture lesson for this morning can be found in the second book of Samuel, beginning with the sixth chapter. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of obed Eam to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for the season of Pentecost is recorded in St. Mark's Gospel, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples' preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, but like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to, marry, to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask for me whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of the John the baptizer. And immediately she rushed back to the king and requested 
I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oath and for his guest, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last Sunday, we all enjoyed a pleasant and familiar sign that normal life and patterns had returned to America. The once silent streets of July 4th, 2020 were again filled with the sound of parades. And of course, it wasn't just in the streets. There were parades on the lakes in boats and on the links with golf carts. Apparently, it's still true, even after a pandemic, that everybody loves a parade, whether in good or bad weather, as G.K. Chesterton once penned, and when it rains on your parade, look up rather than down, for without the rain, there would be no rainbow. Yes, everyone loves a parade, and I'm no exception. In summer as a child, I remember watching parades and waiting for the clowns to pass by. In the fall, our family moved indoors and huddled around our black and white television to see the grainy images of Thanksgiving Day Parade from New York with the giant balloons. Later in high school, I found myself marching in parades. I began as a member of the band Color Guard, and later I was the drum major with a baton and whistle at the head of the band, and I had a great uniform with crimson jodhpur pants, black knee-high spats, and a white tunic with a letter A across it, and a tall fur-covered drum major hat. I was certainly not King David dancing around the ark with 30,000 men, but 76 trombones led the big parade was my high school school theme song. And when I strutted out in front of the parade, people knew that I meant business. Every summer, I trained the new drum corps how to march in sequence and to keep the band in formation. And with five whistle blows, I could set any parade in motion. But very quickly, I discovered that it was equally important to know how to stop that steady beat of the band marching in rhythm. For generations, it has been a practice that marching military units and bands break stride when crossing bridges. The steady rhythms and vibrations of unison marching have been known to collapse them. You see, there is a protocol to marching in a parade. King David would have benefited from knowing the protocol of carrying the Ark of the Covenant in a parade before he began. Perhaps the mishaps which he encountered may have been avoided. Our reading this morning is meant to make King David look good. We were intended to see a joyful, exuberant king praising God and dance before the backdrop of Jerusalem. He has no inhibitions leaping before the ark in nothing more than his loincloth. But that is not the whole story. Both tragedy and delay occurred on that road to Jerusalem, and that is what we want to focus on today. According to the book of Exodus, God instructed Moses to build the ark during his 40 days upon Mount Sinai. The ark would come to house the tablets of the Ten Commandments, which Moses would receive. Basically, the ark was a large movable box, gilded entirely with gold. Four rings of gold were at, attached to the four corners, and through these rings, poles overlaid with gold were positioned for carrying the ark. A golden lid, known as the mercy seat, was placed atop or ornamented with the two golden cherubim. And wherever the Israelites camped, the ark was placed in a separate room in a tent, in a sacred tent called the tabernacle. It was a dwelling place of God and considered too holy 
for humans to enter or to touch. Only members of the priestly tribe, called the Levites, were allowed to carry the ark. The ark traveled with the people of Israel from Mount Sinai for 40 years in the wilderness. Led by the ark, the wandering Israelites crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. The ark also functioned as the religious mascot in the siege of Jericho. In Scripture, the ark then disappears virtually unmentioned until the time of the prophet Samuel, when the ark was kept in Shiloh, the dominant place of worship. The ark then takes center stage in the story when it is captured by the Philistines, subsequently causing so much pain and suffering among them that they give it back to the Israelites, which is how it ended up in the care of Abinadab and his two sons, Uzzah and Ahio. The Ark of the Covenant was the most sacred symbol for Israel and its most prized possession. Unfortunately, the people were also afraid of it. King David understood the symbolic value of the Ark, and he knew that it, if he could transfer the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, his new capital, he could leverage the power of the Ark itself across his entirely newly united kingdom. So yes, the optics were great. Moving the ark was a good religious move as well as a savvy political move. Regretfully, David didn't know the protocol for moving the ark and marching in a parade. The parade began well enough. King David gathered 30,000 warriors to celebrate the transfer with the ark from the home of Abinadab to his capital city. David blew his whistle five times, and the parade began to move in cadence up to the city of David. There were 76 trombones, lyres and harps, tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And as the regal drum major David danced, it was a magnificent parade, except for one tiny detail. There were no Levite priests carrying the ark. Instead, Abinadab, his two sons, Uzzah and Ahio, had fashioned a new cart pulled by oxen to transport the ark. Yes, it was a magnificent parade, and everybody loved the parade, and then they came to that first bridge at the threshing floor of Nacon. The precious ark of the covenant started to topple off the cart in sight of everyone. Uzzah was walking behind it. It all happened so fast, and Uzzah knew that he had to do something disregarding all protocol concerning the ark. He reached up his hand to hold it in place, and at that moment we read that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him, and he died there beside the ark. David's savvy political maneuver had turned against him, and he was angry. He wondered if it was truly wise to bring the ancient relic into his new capital. So instead of completing the journey to Jerusalem, David placed the ark in the home of a man named Obed-Edom, the Gittite, and it remained there for three months. Now you may be wondering, why was David so angry? Simply said he felt misunderstood and humiliated. No, David's intentions were not completely selfless, but he loved the Lord and he wanted God to be honored in his capital city. So he wondered why had he failed. More painfully, however, David felt humiliated. The national celebration he had planned in front of 30,000 onlookers had ended with disaster. David's relationship with God was also being questioned. That's how it feels when God's ways don't match up with our plans. We pray. We struggle. We do our best. And then we feel misunderstood and humiliated when God's strength and power don't carry us through. Happens over and over again in life. Yet, it may happen when you are faced with a difficult medical procedure or when you are laid off from work in the name of 
right-sizing. Happens when your child struggles with friends at school after a move and you don't know how to help. It's in those painful moments that you are tempted to abandon God just when you need him most. It's what David did when he turned the ark over to Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Surprisingly, during the months that the ark was in the possession of Obed-Edom, the Lord blessed this man and his entire household. Despite knowing about Uzzah's fate, Obed-Edom welcomed the ark of the covenant into his home, and he seemed to have no misgivings. Indeed, Obed-Edom trusted that he had nothing to fear. In contrast to David, who saw it as a questionable source of power, Obed-Edom viewed having the ark in his home as a high honor rather than a nuisance. And God rewarded him for his faith. When it was told King David that the Lord had blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all belonged to him because of the ark of God, David finally understood his folly and his failure. And with a new resolve and a respect for the protocol for the ark and for the parade, he planned to move the ark again. This time, however, it would be different. Many burnt offerings were made to ensure the Lord would be honored. The oxen cart was gone. The ark was now carried again by hand, and the parade moved forward into Jerusalem with only shouting and trumpet, just as the ark had been carried once by the Israelites who surrounded and entered the city of Jericho at the time of Joshua, and the walls came tumbling down. David danced and leaped with all his might, and so the Ark of the Covenant came to dwell in Jerusalem. Of course, there's more to the story. David's first wife, Michal, despised her husband's shameful peasant behavior dancing in the streets with nothing more than a loincloth. To her criticism, David predicted that in the future he would become even a more despicable figure. These details may confuse us about what lesson the story should teach us. But personally, I believe the story is about how we are to treat the symbols of our faith. How could King David and Obed-Edom see the ark so differently? There are many today who have made the symbols of faith into their own personal lucky charm. Far too many of us believe that if we can mechanically go through certain emotions or if we can certain spiritual phrases, say them by rote, then God's favor and protection will be guaranteed. Like King David, we are making the Ark of the Covenant into a lucky rabbit's foot. We may do that to the Bible, to the cross, to the church. My friends, when we do that, we run the risk of creating our own Uja moment, a little too much familiarity, and treating God too lightly. In that moment, God will disappoint you, just as he disappointed David. Obed-Edom, on the other hand, trusted that the ark was more than a lucky charm. He knew that it was more than wood wrapped in gold and that it was more than cherubim adorning the mercy seat. He knew that it was always about the holy and living presence of God in his midst. For Obed-Edom, the ark always pointed to the larger story and the promise of God's delivering his people from slavery and his divine guidance into a promised land. And with that trust and guidance, he and his household were richly blessed every day. My friends, everybody loves a parade, and God is at the center of that parade, pouring out his blessings on everyone who receives him. So beware of treating God as your lucky charm. God wants more of you. You don't have to twist God's arm by chanting certain phrases or repeating his name a million times in prayer or having perfect church attendance, which is not all that bad. But like Obed-Edom, you need simply welcome God. Welcome God's presence into your life and into your home 
and indeed you too will be richly blessed and supported even in those difficult times. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy Father, you welcome your people into one family and gather all things to yourself. Bestow your grace upon your beloved church, lavish your wisdom upon us, and redeem us from all our faults, that by our witness all might praise your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer.
awesome creator, you steadfastly tend to the smallest of seeds and the mightiest of sycamore trees. Spring up green growth from the earth, nourish growth of fruit, grain, and other crops, and bless the work of farmers and laborers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the oppressed, turn the ears of those who are in power to the voices of prophets in our own day. Protect those who speak difficult truths when it is risky to do so. Lord, in your mercy. God of strength, you are near to those who endure difficulty. Comfort all who are survivors of violence. Guard the refugee and the immigrant, and protect all those who are victims of prejudice and discrimination. We especially pray today for Matthew Moen, Colin Mason, Ross Formell, Annalita Skold, Sam Pedersen, Jim Peterson, Bruce Payne and Mike Payne, Jim Jody, Peggy Wagner, David Beebe, Bruce Johnson, Howard Thorsheim, and the family of Ruth Sabatke, Beth Addington, and Floyd Dahl. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of love, we pray for this holy house and all those who worship here. We pray especially for those whose efforts behind the scenes often go unnoticed. For the custodians and maintenance workers, for our office staff, and all of our volunteers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, we all love a parade. We love to see that which is passes by. We love that which is exciting and colorful. But we pray, O oh Lord, that you would not pass us by, that in day, indeed, we would, as long ago, we would welcome you and your presence into our homes, into our lives, so that you, the source of, may, of all blessings, may indeed strengthen and bless us. Lord God, there are so many times when we treat you with indifference, and we treat you lightly. Help us, O oh Lord, to treat you as that source of blessing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You. Let us share a word of God's peace with one another. Peace be with you. Michelle, could you grab the Perel?
The congregation may be seated. We're delighted for the many ways in which you have continued to bless this congregation through its ministry, through your own gifts, your offerings, that those who have been sent directly to the church are presented here in the sanctuary, and also for those gifts that are given online at lati.org. We invite you now to consider those gifts as you hear another piece from the French tradition by César Franck, Anis Pangelicus.
Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body, for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sensed prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread and with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is, is risen, Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer your Son, our Savior, first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the King's kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Come to me, all who are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The table has been prepared. All are welcome.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the announcements. Again, we welcome you to Lake of the Isles Lutheran Church on this Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Pray that you would continue to be blessed both here in present, but also those that are watching online. And we pray that this will be a glorious week ahead of you. Immediately following the worship service, you're invited outside for coffee. I thought I thought, saw biscotti out there, but you know, that may have just been, you know, my imagination. But there might be something out there besides um, coffee. Uh, please note the other announcement is simply that we are now in the, um, what is called, and it's kind of a little play on words, and that is the 2021 Bell Appeal. And uh, the bells are going to be delivered uh, next month here to Lake of the Isles, and we are raising uh, $20,000 for one of those bells that will be a part. And the inscription on that bell will read, Now thank we all our God for his faithfulness throughout the COVID-19 pandemic 2020 and 2021. So we pray that you would consider your own gift of thanksgiving for the end of this year. 
Uh, as I say, they will be sending us pictures this coming week of what the bells will look like. And of course, that always means that money is due. So we, uh, we do that as well. But those are the announcements uh, for this day. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. She's off to Hawaii. <laughs>